Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this track of learning technologies. Uh, my name is Vaughan Waller. I'm going to be your track chair in this auditorium uh, for the rest of the day. And here we are with the first session after the start. Um, after listening to the keynote this morning, and I have always thought that the most in interesting thing about applying learning, uh, applying technology to learning is the way that it changes the way we think. And that applies regardless of our age. Now, there, I am certain that there is no one in the audience who have not heard the term digital immigrant, digital native. And the person who coined that phrase and that amazing concept is our next speaker. He's uh, the author of numerous books, numerous journal articles, and is a consultant and um, designer of education and learning. So please put your hands together for a big welcome for Mark Prensky. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for showing up on this, what I guess is typical for uh, England, but seems to me like a very bleak morning. I'm happy to be here having waited for a taxi for a whole hour. Uh, and what I hope is to make this, I have uh, obviously some slides to show you more than usual, but I'm hoping we will have plenty of time to interact. And because I know little about any of you, I would really appreciate your telling me your concerns, interrupt me in the middle, give a 10 minute speech if that's what you prefer to do, that shortens my time, and whatever you'd like, uh, this has to be your session so that you leave it with something. If I am too general, because I'm going to talk about some big comments, then please bring me back to the specifics. If I'm too specific, do the opposite. I thought I'd start with a, a story about an ex-boss of mine. I, was, I worked for the head of HR, or as you could say, HR, right, for a major company that no longer exists. It was eaten up. And he, told, he said a very interesting thing. He reported directly to the chairman of the company. And he said, I've worked for three chairmen. One in person, one by phone, and one by email. And now he's got another job, and I'm sure he works by Twitter. So it's very interesting to see how these relationships change even at the top of the companies and how people, as people's preferences change. So welcome to what I call the worldwide experiment in trying to figure out how to prepare our people in and for a new worldwide context. And this is what I talk about, which I think is the most important thing to think about, is this new context, which is a context of VUCA. How many of you have heard of VUCA? Okay, good. We have some VUCAs in the audience. VUCA is volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. It's a term that came out of military planning. It's moved quite a bit into business planning. All those things are terribly increased in our time. According to the Boston Consulting Group, half of the most turbulent financial quarters during the past 30 years have occurred since 2002. That's the volatility that we have. In terms of uncertainty, I spoke to a scientist who Skypes into elementary school classrooms, and I asked the scientist, what is the message? What's the main message you'd like to leave, with these, ki leave these kids with? And his answer surprised me. His answer was, everything I'm about to tell you is wrong. And of course, what he means is it's the best we know now. It's our best guess. It's our best hypothesis. It's our best theory but it's very likely to change during your lifetime. And that's a different attitude than we've had traditionally in education and learning. Complexity has more to do, more than anything else, in my view, to do with that we have so many more people. I grew up with under three billion, now it's pushing eight. That's a lot of complexity. Plus, we have all the projects that technology enables us to do in terms of space, in terms of building, et cetera, et cetera. And for ambiguity, we've had to invent new terms. Frenemy, competition, 
because these things didn't exist, at least in such abundance as in the past. We have to talk about them in new ways. So VUCA is the beginning. But if that were all, we could probably deal with it. But there's more. Accelerating change. With the emphasis not on the change, which we all know about, but on the accelerating. Change is not just happening faster. It's happening faster and faster and faster. And the best example, BlackBerry. And it was huge. It was, I don't remember what the percentage was, but it was probably 80% of the business market at one point, and now, who did it fall fast? So we're seeing these kind of changes and accelerating pace that are going on. But wait, there's more, as they say on television. We now have extended brains. And I've written a whole book about this. I called it Brain Gain Technology and the Quest for Digital Wisdom, saying that the human brain is just not capable of doing all the things that we've needed so now it's being extended. We can't deal with trillions of data points, but with technology we can. There's a whole theory of the extended mind, and it goes into everything. And that's, to me, the best way to think about technology, as mind extension. So there's no question about whether we should have it or shouldn't have it. Either you, mind, you want your mind to be extended like it needs to be in the 21st century, or you can live in the past. But wait, there's more. The most important thing that's happening is this powerful global network. And there's not just one, there's more than one of them. But that really, to me, is what changes everything. That is the newest and biggest piece of all this change because it changes our relationships and our families and our health and how we get educated, and how we get trained, and how we find work, because that's you've done through the network now, but mostly how we do work. So I'll talk a little bit more about all these things, but what's going on in the world, from my view, is that our young people are in the process of figuring out how to live in this brand new context. We don't know how to live in a networked world. We're just learning how to figure it out, and we are just, effectively, babes in the woods. Now, I'm going to give you a piece of advice. If you're standing in front of a group like this, you don't want to just Google babes in the woods. <laughs> I had to look hard for this picture. But that's what's going on. We are taking the first baby steps in this new context. We are living in a huge worldwide experiment, that's the best way to see us, to define the world of the future where everyone is now a node on the network. That's something that we never were before. And where we're symbiotic with and truly powerful users of all these extensions and all this technology that exists. And already, in the new networked world, we have the first major, major experiment in making everybody, and especially our young people, nodes on the network, and that's Facebook. So that's the way I look at Facebook, and maybe that's the good way that you'd like to look at it, not as the trivial things that we do and the pictures we share and the stuff. It's the experiment in learning how to be networked. And once we learn, and we're comfortable with that, we can move on to far more powerful things. But Facebook already has a seventh of the globe online. It's got a billion accounts. So we're getting there gradually, and of course, because of the accelerating change, we will get to everybody quickly. We already have more than two-thirds of the world having mobile phones. And in addition, What's happened already is this, and this is very important, that the millennials, or whatever you call them, worldwide, the young people, are more similar to each other in country to country to country than they are to the older generations in each country. And that's really important, and I see this for sure 
when I go to Abu Dhabi or I go to, I go to Kuala Lumpur or I go anywhere else or I go to South America and I talk to the kids. And they are talking in exactly the same way and doing the same things. Not every single one of them, of course, but most of them who are available to, who have the ability to get online are very similar to one another. And this is the first time that we have a global generation. It's scaring many parents to death. I go to companies and they say, oh my God, you know, all my kid wants to do is be online. My kid is like that. Many of your kids may be like that. We have to think about that. So, what is the future of education, corporate learning, training, all the things that we are here to do? What does that look like? And here's an image that says it all for me. Right? Now picture building that for adults. I once had a friend who was a piano player, and he, what he wanted, the piece of furniture that he wanted was a piano that in the curve of the piano was a toilet, and then you had a little shower built in. And what we're seeing here is no matter what you're doing, you need to be online. You need to be connected. You're learning this from the very earliest years of your life. And so education, or training, or whatever we call it, is no longer about content, and it's no longer about classrooms. Oh, those things will be with us for a while. But it really is about billions of extended brains networked together. That's really what it's about, so that we can, as I will say later on, train each other. And in an atmosphere of increased VUCA, and accelerating change. That's very different than what we used to do for a living. And wisdom, which is what we're all after, comes not just from the human brain alone, but from the technology and human symbiosis. That's really important to think about that because that's the way young people see it. They're symbiotic with technology starting really early, some of them do it in different ways. Ah, there is some Twitter in the audience. Uh, and I thought that guy was unique. But if you go online and search Google search, you'll find more than one who are doing these kind of things, a way to connect with the technology. And the technology is, of course, renewing itself every day if you don't know how it's done. This is how it's done. Please don't share this with young people. The wisdom that we need, the digital wisdom, comes from combining what our brains do well, and our brains do lots of things well. We all can acknowledge what our brain does well, but combining that with the things that our brains don't do well. One of the things that our brains don't do well is remember everything. Technology, of course, helps us a lot with that. And we need to do it in the best possible way. Because if we don't do it in the best way, we can just be a little bit clever, or we can even be digitally dumb. And my favorite example of digitally dumb is the kid who downloads a paper uh, from the internet to hand in with somebody else's name on it, forgets to take off the other person's name, and just hands it in. And I, this happens all the time. So we're going to have to avoid being digitally dumb and getting digitally wise. And that's what my last book is about. Now, when the context changes, of course, young minds adapt automatically. We don't know enough about the brain. We're at 1 to 5% of our knowledge, according to a lot of brain scientists I talk to. But we do know that it's plastic, and we do know that it adapts to the context. So our kids' brains are different. We don't know exactly how, but we know that they are adapting. And so one way to look at this from a, a corporate point of view or from a, an education, educator's point of view is that on the outside, our employees and our students look like they've always looked. They look like all of us in this room. But on the inside, they're different. And this is the huge fear of a lot of people, the Borg, right? The cyborg that will be that. But we really are cyborgs. We really are. Everybody who in this room, all these people who are tweeting like crazy in the front row, you know, it's just not built into our body yet, but it soon will be. 
we have in this generation the most powerful tools in history. And a big difference from the past, because we've always had powerful tools, there's the atomic bomb, there's a lot of things that are powerful in the world. But here, young people are close to the technology from birth. I don't know what he's saying, but you can see it. Or this guy, we all have this. It's the way kids grow up, attached to the technology, attached to the extensions, having their brains extended. Somebody else said this. This is not a quote from Prensky. I wish it were. Technology is the air they breathe. And I think that sums it up pretty much. And of course, we have to admit that not everybody has equal access to technology. And if any of you want to discuss that, I'm happy to do that. But here's what I observe. Those that don't have it are aspirational for it. They know it exists. They want to have it. They talk about it. They see it. So we're going to all be there a lot sooner. Because of the accelerating change, we're going to be there a lot sooner than some people think. And not only do they know about it, but this is the big difference. They want to use it. They want to do something meaningful with it. That is, I think, new in the world. So they have these most powerful tools, and they want to use them. And my sense, very strongly, and if I leave you with nothing else, this is my message, we hugely underestimate what the generation can and will do. I think, especially, I talk a lot to educators, and I talk a little bit less these days to corporate people, but I think it happens at all levels. We're used to young people not having capabilities, and now they do. So we underestimate. And we get articles like the Me, Me, Me Generation in Time Magazine, and things like this, lazy, entitled narcissists, who still love their parents, etc. But they're going to be transformational. And we're already seeing it. We already see the Googles and the Facebooks and the, these companies taking over the world very quickly. We can be set to see transformation in, if we're older, the rest of our lifetime, certainly if we're younger, in our lifetime. Now, if we're in the corporate world, which many of you are, I understand, we underestimate, I think, what these young people can do for us, for our businesses, and how they can be transformational in those businesses. And if they don't do it for us, because we don't let them, if we don't give them the permission to do this, they'll do it for themselves. Now, I'm sure all of you have heard of Google and their 20% time that you can work on your own on any project, one day a week. That's a lot to give up to say, do whatever you want. But they know that if they don't do that, they, and they only tell people, work on this, work on this, work on this, they will start to lose them. And that's Google. That's at the top. This young lady is French. She's somebody that I knew from birth. Uh, she's the daughter of a good friend of mine. She's a bright girl. Went to schools, some of the good schools in France, good business school, not the top, not HHC, HHC, or the other ones, but she went to a good school. She got hired by Groupon. Good job. Nice to have. After she was at Groupon for less than a year, Google came along and said, oh, you're smart. I'll double your salary. So she went to Google. Well, that's even nicer. Right? She's hanging out at Google. I thought, oh, your life is made. She hated it because they didn't give her things to do that she wanted to do. They didn't let her do even the kind of things that she wanted to do. So what did she do? You know, you, this is surprising. Why would somebody leave Google, which is the greatest job in the world? She left to start her own company. So she now has a company called Eat Your Box, you know, whatever you think of the name. They give you boxes of food to eat. They send them. You subscribe. But she's already bought other companies. She's moved very, very quickly in the world. And she's much happier being an entrepreneur than she was even in the newest of companies. So 
If we use them right, my sense is that our digital native employees, the young ones, the ones our new hires, can be our hidden competitive advantage. They're the ones who are going to push us forward. And if we don't do that, we won't get that push that we really need, but there's a big if. And those of you who are mathematicians, like I once was, if and only if, I-F-F, -F, if and only if we take advantage of what they bring us. And that's the real challenge that we have, I think, as people who are in the kinds of jobs that we do. It's not making people do what we want them to do, it's taking advantage of what they have to bring us that we don't even know about. So what I'm talking about, really, is a change in perspective, and that's really my business. I go around the world trying to change people's perspectives on different things, and maybe this will change yours, maybe you already have this perspective, but it's a change in perspective towards what young employees in a company represent. And the change is from the old pay your dues. Now it used to be, and I have worked in the corporate world for a decade, but I think it still is in many places, you hire new people and what you say to them is pay your dues. That's what a new lawyer does. They do the S work at the bottom of the corporation. And gradually we say, oh, yeah, okay, you did that well, we'll let you move up, we'll do this, we'll give you more responsibility. Okay, that's one way to do it, that's the old way. The other way is reinvent our business. Reinvent our business. Here we are, we are doing very well, we could be at the top of the heap, we're Blackberry. You know, look at us, we have an 80% market share or we're Microsoft. But if we don't reinvent continuously that business, it will die. And guess what, in this new context, we, the old people, are not good enough to reinvent our businesses. Now, as the gentleman explained, I've been talking for longer than I care to admit about digital natives and digital immigrants. You've all heard of this. And after thinking about it for a long time and hearing all the objections and the this and the that, um, I've realized the war is over. That war is over. The natives won. So what natives are, though, for me now, it's not people who just know a lot about technology. It has nothing to do with how much they know about technology, in fact. It has to do that they've only lived in one context. That's the context of today. They have no idea what a phone is that's connected by a wire. They have no idea where the word dial a telephone comes from. They have no idea about lots of things from our past. We, on the other hand, are the immigrants. We've lived in two contexts, the pre-digital age, and the digital age. So I think of us now, I have a new term that I'm going to share with you. The last pre-internet generation. That's who I think almost everybody in this room belongs to. I certainly do. This is Al Gore, who invented the internet. We all know that, right? Uh, he thinks. But look at him. He's got his screens up there, as many of us do, probably all of us do. But he's surrounded by paper and he's surrounded by books. And I think TLPIG, the last pre-internet generation, explains an enormous amount of our behavior. And what got me thinking about this was when they distributed in Los Angeles iPads to all the kids, or they had a plan to distribute iPads to all the kids. It's very nice. And they gave it out to the first school and the kids took them home, and overnight, in one night, they all took these iPads that were supposed to be locked onto only the school network, and they liberated them. They got on the open internet. Every one. And people said, oh my God, how could they have done this? This is terrible, said all the adults. And law enforcement was thinking about this, and maybe we have to change all our plans. And my answer to that was, TLPIG, because no kid would have a powerful device like an iPad and not want to use it on the open internet. Nobody would do that. They just wouldn't accept that. 
So as TLPIG, what we bring is tons of baggage and ideas from the past. All the previous centuries before the internet are on our shoulder that we bring. And what do we do with these things? We load them on our kids. And they're from a different generation. So, we, the TLPIG, are employing, we are the employers of the internet generation, of the first fully internet generation, who also happens to be the first global generation, as we talked about. All those people are doing exactly the same thing. So here are the kind of questions that come up. Is this bad? If this were your dinner table, would it be bad? If this were your boardroom, if this were your meeting rooms, would this be bad? Some of you may think so. Or, for their generation, is it really the future? And it's the best party ever. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing this huge transition from ways in which we communicated, from things that we considered normal in our generation, and that sometimes people go so far as to say that are human. Well, they're not so human because people can do without some of them. And we all like to think of all the positive things that are in our generation. We're, we're learned, we have books, we've built big companies, we've done huge, wonderful things in our generation. And I agree. But there are also negative impacts. And I see these in my kid. I have an eight-year-old. I see these things, the negative impacts. One of them, not listening enough because we know our way is right. There's Mr. Blackberry again. Right? Oh, yeah, we know. We've got it right. We're doing this. Look at our 80% market share. Look at how learned we are. Look at how many books we've read. Look at all these kind of things. Don't tell me anything else. We crush out creativity. Why? Because it doesn't look like what we're used to seeing. This is one of my favorite houses. The architect and the, and the person who built this house, I, have any of you seen this before? They went out into the Mojave Desert where they mothball planes, and for a pitiful sum, which is probably less than 20,000 pounds, they bought a 747. And they transformed that 747 into a house, maybe more than one house. And the cockpit is part of the house, and the other things, and the toilets, and everything. And this is a, you know, a huge way to do things differently that we kind of have to get used to. Except, and I have to say this up front, I, would, I originally was going to put this at the end, but it's important to say it up front. Except in certain very specific old situations, 20th century type situations, today's young people do not have to talk face to face to get stuff done. Like these guys, you know who these guys are. They don't have to look each other in the eye to get things done, although some people like that. They don't have to avoid using technology while talking. So getting your email and having a conversation, perfectly acceptable as long as they can do it. Except, of course, in those other cases, they don't have to do that in order to get their work done because the technology is so powerful. And so we're seeing a huge change in human behavior. There's nothing wrong with looking people in the eye. I do it. I teach my kid to do it. But he doesn't want to do it all the time. He's happy to talk to me while he's playing Minecraft. So let's talk a little bit. I want to talk a little bit about this te powerful technology use. It's accelerating exponentially, right? We know that. Some people are a little afraid of it. It's got some, some fearful things. It was slow to take off. It's in the accelerating phase, and it's, going, it's moving into the exponential phase. So there are a lot of people who will say, oh, yeah, universal translation. They've been talking about that forever. And they have. But these things are going to happen because we are on that rapid part of the change where we double in power very much, much more quickly. 
So I made a little chart and said, well, it took 40 years to get to a billion cell phone users. It took only 20 years to get to the World Wide Web a billion. And then it took less and less time each time to get to a billion of something. And now we have a billion YouTubes up there. We, have, we are certainly at a billion views a day. We're do so the new number that we're looking for is a billion. I hear schools or other people say, oh, yeah, you know, we have several thousand or we have several hundred thousand. I'm saying, who cares? Nobody cares about that scale anymore. We care about the scale of billions and how to get there fast. And what we're going to see in the lifetime of today's kids and in many of our lifetimes, technology will become a trillion times more powerful. How do you get that? You double every year for 40 years. That's more than a trillion. So we're starting to see this huge, huge increase in power. We see aorta coming. This is a friend of mine, Mark Anderson's term, always on real-time access. So it never goes off. It never goes off. It would be silly. It's like we don't walk around naked. We don't walk around with our technology off. Universal literacy. Everybody talks. Once you can take your mobile phone and you can run it over any text and it will be read to you in any language, because we have that power now in the cloud, and once you can say whatever you want to say and it will print it out in any language, what we have struggled for so many years in literacy will not be a problem anymore. Real-time translation. How many of you use Google Translate? Have you noticed how much better it keeps getting? It's just every time you go, it's better. It's not perfect. Everybody agrees. Every language teacher in the world will laugh at it and tell you not to use it. But oh my goodness, it just keeps getting better. Why? Because it records everything that you ask for. Same with voice to text. How many of you use voice to text a lot? I write all my books that way now. I don't bother typing, unless I'm in a crowded place where I can't babble. But it's so good because, again, it records every conversation. One of the interesting things now is that it's not as good for kids because the kids don't use it as much, so it doesn't have as big a database to go on. But once we start using it, we convince our teachers in the schools that that's an important way to input text, then that will get hugely better in a very short time. Now, the jewelry that we wear, this is a, this is a mobile phone. That stuff can get implanted under your skin now. This is already today. We have these contact lenses that have electronics built into them so that you can be watching whatever video or TV or whatever you like there. And the, if you think people are distracted today, wait till everybody's walking around with the Super Bowl in their, in their eyes or whatever the equivalent is here. And importantly, the young people thrive on this. They love this change that it's different every week and different every month and different every year. They were born to the idea of rapid change. This came up in a science fiction book that I read from 1995, and I, I think this author got it absolutely right. They were born to this. They love this, but we, the TLPIG, not so much. And we have to be very careful because we're going to see things come and go frequently. Remember this? Going to change the biggest thing in the world, the Segway. Well, it was great until the president of Segway drove over a cliff and died. And now it's a niche product. Okay, it's still there. This, Google Glass, we don't even know. It might have died before it was born. And we'll move on to other things. We still don't know. That's still in the process. So as the things that we thought were great yesterday, and this is one of my favorites. Remember old Arnold Schwarzenegger? Well, this is what he looks like today. <laughs> right? Things grow old very quickly. I was talking to a classroom of, uh, uh, in a school, and they said, we have no money. I was saying, everybody's got to use video. And they said, well, we have no money to buy video for everything. I said, all you have to do is ask the people in your relatively wealthy district to give you all the phones in their drawers that they no longer use. 
Every single one of them can take video at some level. So they would have millions. They would have more than enough for every kid. We need to futurecate. And this is a term that I coined because I noticed that in my eight-year-old's class, everything was books. Everything was the past. The computers were never turned on. There was no feeling of being connected to the world. That never happened in the classroom. And so I called his teacher a past-educator. She wasn't a bad teacher, but she really brought him into the past. They did spelling bees. They did things like that. They didn't do anything that connected them to the future. So the way I see futurecation is a rebalancing. It's not getting rid of the past. Nobody wants to do that. We have to show reverence for the past, but not live in it. The past, as Shakespeare said, is prologue. And the prologue is that little piece at the beginning of the book. We have to fully exploit the tools that we have, which we don't do. And sometimes we, because of we have security concerns or other concerns, which are valid, we don't let people go far enough. And we have to use the technology in very powerful ways. So, Skyping and tweeting, obviously. We couldn't do these things before. We couldn't communicate in real time. When you hear that something is happening in a place, you can now go to it on Google Maps. Or you can go and start, sky start Skyping and tweeting right to that place where something is happening. Virtual worlds, people from all the world can be working together, as you know. I'm not telling you these new tools. I'm just saying they exist. Simulations, bigger and better and going back all the time in history. Not just things, but people simulations are becoming a whole lot more important. Databases and the computation engines, the things that Wolfram Alpha represents where they curate the world's data. And so you can ask a question like, well, suppose everybody spread out on the earth in all the arable land. How much arable land is there per person? And Wolfram Alpha will go say, it will calculate from its database how many people are in the world, how many hectares or acres are in the world. It'll do the division, it'll do the calculation. And many things that we used to require experts for are now can be done through Siri. Because Siri is connected to Wolfram Alpha. And the world has thousands and hundreds of thousands of public databases that are totally underused. They're hardly used at all because we don't have access to them easily. But there's a database of every single airplane in the air. There's a database of histories of countries. And the UN has huge amounts of data. National governments collect huge amounts of data that haven't been available in the past and now are instantaneously. We've all been hearing about the Internet of Things, so now all our things are connected to us, to each other, to us, so we can control them in new ways. 3D printing is going to take over the world. It's already starting. Robotics, huge. Kids are starting to do this early. How do all these things impact your business? is what the young people ought to be thinking about. That's what your young employees should be doing. Now, this is a conference on learning, right? Learning technology. I have a little bit different point of view. And I'll put it to you in terms of a question. Which would you rather have your employees do? Would you like them to learn more? Or would you like them to become better and more competent? And those two are not exactly congruent. They're not the same thing. Because you can know a lot and not be competent at all. Learning is, of course, one means of becoming. And that's been a means that we talk about, and that's why we have this conference. But it turns out there's a better means of becoming than learning, and that's accomplishing things. Now, you have to learn to do that, and it's all one big, it's all a mishmash together, but where do you put the emphasis? 
where do you put the emphasis? Do you put it on the learning, and then we're going to have learning tools and learning technologies and learning this and that? Or do we put the emphasis on becoming better and more competent, at which point there's lots of ways and we can start accomplishing things? And for years, I've been telling people, don't ever send anybody to training or give them a training app or whatever it is. People hate training. I used to be in it. Nobody would go. I worked for a big bank. It had traders making a million dollars a year. They wouldn't go to training if you dragged them. But if you called it innovation, if you said, guess what? In this session, we're going to figure out new ways to do business. We're going to do it better. Yes, you might have to learn some things about how the business operates in order to do that. But the goal is not to just push stuff into you. The goal is for you to improve the business and to innovate. So finally, I was going to talk about what can we learn from watching the kids today. And most of you probably have kids. I have an eight-year-old, as I said. I'll show them to you in a minute. What's interesting about the young people, and especially the young people enhanced by all the new technologies, is that they approach old situations in new ways. And this is the most profound thing I ever heard a young person say, and maybe almost anybody say. You guys, older, TLPIG, think of technology as tools. Sets of tools. Which one should I use? Which one should I buy? I got to go out there. I got to look at them all. We think of it as a foundation. It underlies everything we do. That's, to me, that's a very big, important change in perspective. That you've got to have that technological foundation. The connection is more important than whatever you do with it. So here's a little video. Let's see if we can do this. This is a kid who calls 911, the emergency service. And he says, I need help with my math. Sure. What kind of math do you have that you need help with? What math? Takeaways. That's the mother. There you go. You said when I needed help, I should call somebody. And hey, the, he's smart. Call the police, right? 911. It's right there at his fingertips. That's a huge change in the world of seeing you don't have to figure it out yourself all the time. I, I don't understand why our schools still do that and learn by yourself and learn on your own. None of our companies do that. None of us would say, don't talk to a colleague, whatever you do. You know, if it takes you twice as long, I don't care, do it yourself. No, we don't say that. That's not the world we live in. The kids know to call. For the young people, technology is foundational in the way reading used to be foundational. We would say, go look it up. Go look up in a book. My kid always says to me, go search it up. Now, But it's replacing reading. Not that reading isn't important in many situations, and we, yes, there's always going to be people who know how to read and learn how to read, but it's being replaced fundamentally by other things. And I, when I was in the corporate world, we had these binders you know, in training that were, that were huge. It was all just words and reading and reading, and people used to use them to build cubicles when they'd been to enough conferences like this, enough training sessions. This is my son. This is Sky. He's eight. Now, he goes to school. He goes to a very nice program, gifted and talented, and they teach him to spell and write and do all the traditional things and a few new things. What does he do when he comes home from school? Every single second we let him, which is not all the seconds, he gets on this little computer and he does Minecraft. How many of you have heard of Minecraft? Okay. Minecraft is a wonderful program for kids. It's a building program and it also can be a competitive or a creative program. But they've done something incredibly clever. They said, we're going to put the emphasis on this working really fast. So it's ugly. 
It's pixelated. It's not had none of the graphics that you see in the top end video games at all. The, absolutely the opposite. But it works, and it works really fast. And he has built cities and hotels and bars and all sorts of things. And I think that's wonderful, and he does it by himself, and he does it with his friends. But here's what really blew me away. Came back one day, and he said, I applied for the committee uh, that, that builds the new lands. I don't know what they call it, but they have to keep building new lands for people to use. And then I said, oh, that's really good. You know, you're eight, be on the committee. <clears throat> and then he didn't get on. They rejected his application. I thought, oh, and it was a pretty good application. I read it. It was a paragraph that he'd written. <coughs> Excuse me. I thought he'd be devastated. No, I'll just apply for something else, he said. So then he applied for the competition committee. And he got on. And now, next month, he is judging, eight-year-old, judging a worldwide competition to build the best stadium or whatever it is. And that's what he's doing. So this is what people are capable of at eight years old. And it's, you know, I'm not saying that my kid represents every kid in the world. It's terrible to use your own kid as the, as the ideal for everybody. But my observation generally is that our young people can do much more than we give them credit for and that we ask them to do. And that the best approach to do is to say, surprise me with what you can do. Here's a problem. It's really hard. I haven't been able to solve it. Surprise me. Give them their heads. Let them do this stuff. They will blow your socks off. Use the tools that they use. My sense, how many of you are involved in training in some way or corporate training or things? My sense is you could do everything that we need to do in training with three tools today. Twitter, for whenever you need to share some text and ideas. Video, when you have to share a little bit longer, but probably not more than a 30 seconds or a couple of minutes. And simulation. I don't see anything you couldn't do with those three tools and the connectivity of the internet. Now, the only thing is we might want to have a database of who did what, et cetera. You can, you can get a tool. But you don't need all the fancy stuff. You don't want to wind up like the universities that spend a fortune putting in infrastructure so that the kids could have email addresses that ended in .edu. And then the kids stopped using them. Nobody wanted the official one. Today, the kids can train each other. They are so good at peer-to-peer, -peer, the young people. You just say, make sure all of you are up to speed. This is the level we want you to be at. Do it and they will do it. We don't have to do it to them anymore. Uh, it's true in school, it's true in corporations, it's true at all these levels. So the future is here. And as the old quote, it's not evenly distributed, it's getting a lot more distributed. Be a future taker. Think of yourself. That's, to me, that's the change in perspective that I would like anybody involved in helping anybody with education get. Our young people are really clever. This is another video. I love this. One this minute. Is from your country. One minute, please. Anybody seen this? Good. Time, thank you. Could you all please put down your pens and bring your papers to the front of the room? Thank you. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, you're too late. Gave you plenty of warnings about time. You failed. Sorry. Excuse me, do you know who I am? I have absolutely no idea. Good. So they will invent things that we have absolutely no idea about. The ship is sailing. Their ship is sailing. Don't let it sail without you. This is my favorite cartoon that I found recently. <laughs> if you're a person, and I hope you all are, who wants to think and innovate 
and accomplish and make the world a lot better place than when you found it. These are the most exciting times in the history of human beings because there's so much potential. We're at the ground floor of a whole new world to come. And of course, adapting to this whole new context can be a little hard. It can be a little scary. And at times, it can even be unpleasant. But we can do it. So let's prepare ourselves and our young people and our young employees to live and thrive in the new context. Thank you very much. We still have 10 minutes. Uh, was there any questions for Mark Price? Run in the front here with the rapid hand. I might have to echo it to the audience, so fire away. How many agree with everything that I said? <laughs> Good. I've got two young grandchildren, one three and one one, and they are already my one-year-old grandson swipes across my phone and things like that, and my three-year-old granddaughter loves my iPad. Their parents, I'm ashamed to say, are not very technical. How can I, what could I do to help them most? Should I buy them each an iPad, or you know, how can I help to cultivate what they already intuitively have? I'm a big fan of hand-me-ups. You know, we used to have hand-me-downs with clothing. You probably still have that. Take the iPad and buy it for the kid. And let whatever the kid had before become the parent's new computer. <laughs> because they don't need the fancy stuff. The kids need the fancy stuff. Everybody's doing this. I think it's just really a question of, of talking and not being afraid of the things. And making sure, uh, I put limits on my kid. I, we, we say, you know, spend some time reading, spend some time outdoors. Because if he, we didn't, he would spend all the time on the computer. I don't think that's a bad thing. I say, oh my God, look at the age he lives in. He wants to be part of this. This is fantastic. He still has to be a human being. So all I would say is encourage the people. Don't let them get scared by the fear. They're not, it's their parents. Uh -huh. Now that's what I'm saying, the parents. <laughs> Don't let people who are from TLPIG, the last pre-internet generation, be so afraid that kids are going to be uh, in contact with people they shouldn't be or do these things. Those dangers are there, but they're minimal. The power that this technology has for our kids is unbelievable. And it's our job to encourage that. And I'm seeing, it's interesting that you should make this comment because we're seeing a lot more connection between grandparents and kids through the technology than we ever saw before. So we have to learn to bring the parents in to that conversation as well. Thank you. Thank you. I think this lady was hand, hand up first. Um, I think it's great that organizations are um, recognizing that digital natives can really add value to businesses. Um, but obviously, a lot of challenges come with that. Do you have any example of um, organizations who are doing that well, who've embraced a cultural change through digital, and how we've done that? Do you want to echo that one? Yes. Um, the question was that there are, it's great that organizations are embracing the digital natives and some of their talents. Do I have specific examples? The most obvious examples that we see are the, are the poster children, are the, are the Googles of the world. We're also seeing some opposite things. Yahoo took all its people, and I would, I would have been the first to say, oh, work, work from wherever you want. And then uh, Melissa Meyer came in and said, no, 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 I'll come into the office because we're going to mix. And my sense is that that will, uh, will even out. I think that the forward, there are forward thinking organizations and there have been going way back. When GE had Jack Welch as its head and the computer first came out, spreadsheets, he paired up, literally, he did a reverse mentoring where every senior executive was paired up with a new hire. And I think we need to do things like that today. I think we have to reduce the hierarchy. Um, who is doing it exactly? I don't know. I'm not following that. But I bet if you looked, you'd find out. And, and the Google model is one that is being looked at by, I can guarantee, every CEO and head of HR in the world because it's working for them. The gentleman there. Uh, two things, Mark. First one, um, we had the equivalent of a 911 call here in the UK last week with Manchester United fans. 
second point is... Manchester United? Yeah, yeah. Okay. A very unhappy fan has called up 999 uh, wanting Alec Ferguson back. <laughs> and I hope they help. <laughs> terrible, terrible. terrible. Um, but quite amusing. My main point um, was you, you talk a lot about, about young people's technology, and I'm the first to believe in that. But the thing I think is, I, I perhaps disagree with you, is that you know, business will always be done face to face at some point. People will always buy from people. I don't care if it's 10 years, 50 years, whatever. I don't see technology ever 100% replacing that. There will always be people skills needed, and the people that will succeed will have those people skills. And I just wonder what your take was on that and, and how you get that balance right in education. Well, I'm glad you said the last word, balance because it always will be a balance, and nothing goes away in the world. I read a book not too long ago that said people are still in one part of the world making and selling flint arrowheads. So what happens is that things move into niches, and so there will probably always be a group of people who want to think that it's best to do business face to face, just like there are nudists in the world and there are other people in the world. But my observation, and it may not be the same as your observation, is that there's more than one way to do it, and that it may be, turn out, that yes, it's good to meet face-to-face -face once, and then after that, okay, we've looked each other in the eye once, we can do this thing. My whole business, everything that I have done in business has been, has been remote. So I do business all the time with people I have never met, even at this conference, when I finally, uh, there's a, a wonderful woman named John Koi who's helping to run this conference, and I had an image of her in my head because I'd only talked to her in email, and then I got her voicemail, and she had a very different voice than I, than I thought. But th I don't think that that gets in the way of anything. I think that the idea of people, what, what you think is a universal, people will always want to look people in the eye, I think you should also question whether that is TLPIG. I, you misunderstand me slightly. By face to face, that could be virtually. I'm talking about educating people on people's skills, which can be done through email, through Facebook, through text, whatever. I think that's what's starting to disappear. I'll, I'll ask you that's in a second. That's so key. Um, I, I, okay, now I understand you a little better. I have a new curriculum for the world. I didn't talk about it here, but I'm calling it the Uplift Curriculum. I'm writing my next book about it that says, let's replace at the top level of our education maths and language and science and history with four new things. Effective thinking, effective action, effective relationships, and effective accomplishment. So relationships, are there. you and I would be in perfect agreement, we have to learn to have effective relationships. Those will take many different forms a variety of forms in the future because we have so many different ways to have relationships now. <coughs> but if you don't know to have, how to have relationships with another person, you're handicapped yeah. in the world. Now, I was just going to ask you about social and emotional intelligence because there's a big wave of requirement now, from, particularly in America, to teach young children social and emotional intelligence. And there's been a, a sort of bell um, supporting the way they're doing it, which is a big program which is having Okay, it, if we get into the brain, then we get into very difficult areas because we don't know much. Well, neuroscience has proved that if your brain is not paying attention to something, then you won't remember it. Uh, neuroscience is one of those things that, that is, is at 1% and evolving. So, so what we have is we have behavioral experiments that may indicate what you're saying. We have no idea what's going on in the brain when that happens. But, but that's not the point. The point is that... that Relationships are very important. I don't have family dinners. We eat individually. We have plenty of conversation in my family. It doesn't happen around the dinner table because we don't do it that way. 
Relationships are important. Thinking is important. You know what we mostly ignore? Action and accomplishment. And here's what bothers me more than almost anything in the world. How many of you have heard of the book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People? Right? Many of you have. We know, because this person did a lot of research, what the seven habits of highly effective people are. Begin with the end in mind, be proactive, et cetera, et cetera. We don't teach those to our kids. How could we know that and not teach that stuff to our kids? So yes, emotional intelligence, as we learn more about that stuff, teach it to the kids. As we learn more about teaching ethics, teach it to the kids. And the part that interests me in, when, in, in writing this book is that everywhere in the world, as you suggest, there's a group focused on a little piece of this puzzle. There are people who say we have to talk about verbality much more than writing. There's a, period, there's a group that says we have to talk about design thinking in addition to systems thinking, in addition to mathematical thinking. There's a group that says we have to talk about uh, everything, and most of these groups actually have curricula. But we don't bring them into our schools, we don't bring them into our companies. I spoke to a father not too long ago who said, yes, the first thing I did when my son got out of school is I sent him to a negotiation course. Well, yeah, that's a really important person-to-person -person skill that we don't teach very much in most of our schools and we don't develop often in our companies. So if you're interested, I will add to, uh, you can again get this thing and I will add to it my ideas for how the curriculum should evolve but I, again, thinking, acting, relating, and most of all, accomplishing. Those are the things that I think we have to put at the top level and make sure all our young people and our older people know how to do. Right. Well. Does that do it? Anyone? That does it. I'm afraid we're out of time. So could we all just put our hands together and thank Mark Practice.